everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Navarji, for that kind introduction. It's my real honor to be here and to be invited to moderate this panel tonight. And uh, it's pleasing to see so many familiar faces and, and to see some new faces tonight as well. Um, like Navarji said, I've been part of the creative industry for some time. And my personal view is that storytelling through any form of media, whether it's cinema or TV or art or uh, print, online, whatever it might be, has the ability to either heal or hurt, especially those who are marginalized in our community. And I will come back to what marginalized mean, and our panel who's here will actually shed some light on it, so I won't go too much into it, but for everyone's understanding, just touching upon what it really means. Uh, I come from a point having played the lead in a few movies and I'm really pleased to see Karan as my co-actor in some of them. And he might not like what I'm going to say, but I will stay anyway. <laughs> uh, having played the lead in some of the films that I have worked, um, it's apparent how women have been underrepresented in a lot of those movies. And I say that because I'm sure most people in this room would agree that women are recognized as the and universally recognizes the marginalized group uh, across the world, across communities. Um, so what does marginalized mean? I've got a simple definition which I picked from online, so uh, picked online, so bear with me on that. As a simple definition, it's the process whereby something or someone is pushed to the edge of a group and accorded lesser importance. This is predominantly a social phenomenon by which a minority or subgroup is excluded and their needs or desires are ignored. Now the groups that fall under this category vary from country to country depending on their cultural ethos. For example, in America, perhaps people with dark color or black color were the marginalized and probably still are in some sections. In Australia, it could be the Aboriginal and, and Indigenous communities and people, or the traditional owners of this country, as we say it. Women are already referred, perhaps those homeless, those with a disability, LGBTI community, migrants, new refugees, and the list goes on and on and on. So you, I, I hope you get a little bit of insight on what marginalized really means here. So, I'd like to ask everyone here, when you go to the cinema and you switch on your TV boxes, do you think what kind of stories are we seeing? What kind of diverse communities are being presented on those channels? Are we seeing diverse faces? Are we, seeing, are we hearing diverse voices? What does that really mean? With that thought, I'm really excited to hear from some of the panelists that are here tonight. Uh, which are somewhat diverse. <laughs> um, they will share their views on the representation of the marginalized in media and cinema. And I'd like to introduce them, so please hold on to your applause till I've finished introducing them. The very first person that I'd like to invite is, uh, is actually Professor Dirk D. <laughs> Uh, professor Dirk has made numerous, please come and join us here, Professor, thank you. Uh, he's made numerous experimental documentary and animation films and videos over the last 30 years. He has received funding to produce a number of films and has continued to maintain a no-budget, independent, self-funded focus for much of his work. He was a founding member and past president of MIMA. I hope I got that good. Great, MIMA. Been, right. Uh, been involved with French Network and been a member of the Melbourne Super 8 Film Group. He has written about and curated various programs of film and video art internationally and written extensively about the area of arts practice. During the late, 19, uh, during the late 90s, he was involved in an independently weekly screening program of film and video art at the Café Bohemio. Uh, he's lived in Canada. His understanding science, road movie, doubt were largely produced by teaching animation at Emily Carr College of Art and Design in Vancouver. 
It's very impressive. He's currently teaching animation and digital culture at Deakin University here at this campus. Welcome to the panel. Uh, my next panelist is Dr. Vikrant Kishore, which I'm sure most people in the room know of. I'll introduce him. He's an academic filmmaker, photographer, author, and journalist. He has more than 25 documentaries and corporate films to his credit. Currently working at Deakin University as a senior lecturer in screen and design, he's the course director for film, television, and animation. Dr. Kishor has been actively working for the safeguard and preservation of the cultural heritage of East India, especially child dance through his India-based NGO, National Institute for Chow and Folk Dance. A recipient of prestigious IPR Scholarship Australia, Dr. Kishor was a short-term fellow at the Carl Jasper Centre, Cluster of Excellence, Heidelberg University, Germany. He has been a jury member for various film festivals. His areas of research are Indian cinema, Indian folk, popular culture, reality television programs, and issues of caste politics in India. He has also uh, authored the book, From Real to Real, Folk Dances of Indian Bollywood Cinema, and co-edited book, Bollywood and its Others, which has been published by uh, Palgrave Macmillan. In 2017, uh, Rutledge published his co-edited book, Salam Bollywood. And he has also worked and directed a 12-part series, which is very popular uh, in, in Australia and in Melbourne particularly, which is called It's My Daisy Life for SBS Hindi Australia. Welcome, Dr. Kishore. And uh, I believe Dr. our third panelist is Dr. Martin Potter. Martin is an academic and multi-award winning creative director and producer of Transmedia and Media for Development Projects including the internationally acclaimed Big Story Small Towns. His work has been funded by the international funders, including UN agencies such as UNICEF and UN Habitat, the European Union Media Fund, USAID, and the list goes on. Um, he has been an Asia League Develop Fellow, Ian Potter Trust Fellow, and produced 20 hours of commissioned broadcast television content in Australia. He lectures in screen and design at Deakin University. Welcome. Our next panelist is uh, David Black. He has been a creative all his life. He was the editorial cartoonist for The Truth in 1989-1990 and won an award in 1990 at the Coffs Harbour Rotary National Cartoon Awards. In 1990s, he started the gothic rock band Darkness Visible, which had put out nine music videos. His main love is films, films and films. He produces, directs, and stars in a hosted horror show called Horror House. Please welcome David to the panel. Welcome. Our next panelist is uh, Daniel Schultz-Hayes. I hope I pronounced that correctly. That's great. Okay. I'm relieved. <laughs> All right. Daniel has worked in the production department on film and television as an independent producer, including credits on iView, and as a screen educator for more than 20 years. As training manager at Open Channel, he ran two screen conferences attended by more than 600 people. In 2013, Daniel was awarded a prestigious research fellowship through the International Specialized Skills Institute to visit micro-budget and production schemes in the UK and Europe. In 2016, he established the Cinespace organization, which is dedicated to supporting the development of culturally diverse filmmakers and content creators in Melbourne. That's pretty cool. Uh, Cinespace has already produced five short films and developed more than 30 scripts in the Story Lab collaboration with Film Victoria. He's also working with Matthew Victor Pastor as a producer. Wait, our next panelist is Matthew Victor Pastor. Um, he is an Australian filmmaker of Filipino heritage and alumnus of the prestigious Victorian College of the Arts. His master's film, I'm Jupiter, I'm the Biggest Planet, was awarded Best Director and completed a successful film festival run. 
is one of the first Filipino-Australian narrative feature film directors to tell second-generation stories. Recently, he has accomplished an impressive four independent feature films in a time span of 15 months and embarking on another two year, uh, features this year. Founding editor of Senses of Cinema, Bill Mosulis, described Pastor as the most dynamic young filmmaker I have come across in 35 years. I'm sure we feel the same way, Victor. Please welcome you to the panel. <laughs> um, I'd like a show of hands if you're in the panel. And my, uh, please if, pardon my ignorance uh, if I don't recognize you already. Miss Rosario Zaro? Great. I, I guessed it was you, but I didn't want to be uh, presumptuous. Um, Ms. Aro has been an educator for the past 17 years, including teaching Italian science and history in government schools, and the last nine years in cultural organizations. At Museum Victoria, Museo Italiano, and the State Library of Victoria, Ms. Aro's role was to produce and deliver education programs based on the cultural organizations, exhibitions, and collections. She has delivered many innovative programs in the Italian language and culture at Melbourne Museum, Immigration Museum and Science Works, and more recently has coordinated and implemented programs and education resources at Museum Victoria in French, Spanish, and Japanese. Uh, she has managed uh, many events, exhibitions, school, and public programs. Please welcome Ms. Rosario Zara to the panel. Thank you. Well, there we go, ladies and gentlemen, that's our lovely panel, and I'm so pleased to see some diversity there. <laughs> it's great. So, all of you, I hope you're ready to share your views and thoughts. So, the way it's going to work is, I'm going to invite you one by one to share your thoughts. So, if you can take it for your four minutes, that would be great. And from then on, we'll have a sort of a q and I'll prompt some questions, and more importantly, open the panel uh, to the floor and get questions from the floor for you to answer. Right. Uh, in no particular order, I think I'm going to invite Professor Dirk to please come up forward and present his views on the topic. Uh, so, do you want me to come out there? Oh, yes. If you, if you, whatever you prefer. I, I like the idea of sitting here. Yeah. <laughs> That's the and closer moving, you by your... And moving the microphone. Your choice. Great. Okay, thank you. And it's a privilege to be here on this group, this first group, to talk about these issues. Uh, my background in terms of my filmmaking is it's been very experimental in that sense marginal and it's always been about looking for an alternative voice. It's usually been done without a, high, a lot of budget, uh, high budget. Um, I didn't really understand why I started to work like that but over time I started to understand that in a funny way in terms of where I placed myself within film culture it, was, it reflected you know, in my parents' background and my migrant kind of heritage that, uh, that brought me to Australia. Because in, my parents migrated to Australia in 1958 when I was eight years old. And so those experiences about, you know, at that stage, this idea of assimilation, this is before multiculturalism, were an important sort of influence on my, my relationship with becoming an Australian. And I've since sort of made films about that, about my mother's uh, you know, their history uh, in Australia, a documentary about that and also more experimental found footage films about that area. Uh, for me, the, you know, the, the term that was used for the migrant in the 50s and the early 60s was the, world new, was the word New Australian. And the idea of being a New Australian was, uh, sounded very inclusive, but in the sense that meant that you were not an Australian because you were new, you were kind of asked to give up all your, the things that you brought to the country and become Australian. But in a sense, I experienced that, my parents experienced that as a very limbo term. And I tried to kind of, in my later filmmaking, when I started to understand that, to kind of talk about that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. For me, in terms of cinema, abstraction was also very important early on, where in a sense, it seemed to be that I wasn't really saying anything, but in a sense, I was kind of talking about a kind of fog or a kind of wall that was kind of experienced, you know, in a very kind of visceral level that I didn't quite understand. And I can think of 
a lot of my filmmaking over the last 20 or 30 years is trying to process that. And I've also uh, come to understand that, uh, you know, we're now living in a time, I think, when uh, the idea of abstraction becomes very useful in talking about a lot of things that don't get talked about. Because even though there's a lot of rhetoric, et cetera, about inclusiveness and diversity, on other levels, it remains an unspoken kind of taboo in, in, in some areas. And a lot of those things happen, to, uh, in my experience, on very kind of subtle ways. And that they're usually the most powerful in terms of uh, getting those men, uh, impacting the kind of pain or exclusion on those people who are on the other end of that. So that's kind of always interested me. I don't kind of feel necessarily that I, uh, not disempowered, but I, I find it very important to me in terms of my filmmaking to try and talk about those little things. Maybe I'll leave it at that. That's probably about three minutes, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, we can pass around the mic. Yes, who, who to next? Oh, thank you. I'm David Black. Um, I can build on what you were saying. You were saying that your parents are uh, considered new Australians. Uh, I believe that we're moving towards cultural diversity and a fair go in the country, but I don't think we're there yet. I'm of a Jewish background and my um, ancestors came out here in 1855. So you would say, oh, fifth generation Australian, but no, I was always told I wasn't. You know, uh, nobody says that now. Uh, but uh, it was, you can't be an Australian, you're a Jew. So, yeah, I grew up with that. But it's easy to play the victim in this sort of thing. I'd like to say something that nobody, I think, has ever stood up and said. But I reckon I was prejudiced as hell. I had a good heart, but I grew up with Bugs Bunny cartoons. We all, we all did. And one day I became the editorial cartoonist of the truth. Big paper. Uh, 500,000 uh, were printed uh, twice a week. That's a one and a half million uh, readership in a country that had 16 million people. And I presented my first cartoons to the editor. We had, uh, I think, Salman Rushdie, that affair that was going on in Tiananmen Square. And the first thing the guy does is he freaks out. He goes, you can't draw Arabs that way. I'd drawn her son Chop, you know, from Bugs Bunny. And he said, you can't draw Chinese people with buck teeth. I swear blind I wasn't a prejudiced person. I had, I had friends of all backgrounds, but I grew up on this stuff and I drew it. And it got me thinking. And to this day I'm thinking, every time we've got something that hits the media, suddenly I look back at myself and I go, am I guilty too? Just because I'm Jewish, and yes, I copped it. I copped anti-Semitism in the street, where the kids are there and they're going to say, I'm going to beat you up, you Jew, and they come out at you at five at a time. Many people think if you cop that, you're beyond prejudice, you can't be. But I think we have all grown up in a prejudiced society. We've all um, got prejudices in ourselves. I think we're moving towards a better place. And I hope to be a better person, and my heart's in the right place. But if today there are prejudices in me that I'm blind to, and I can look back in 10 years, I hope not to be ashamed to be saying, life is a process, and I hope we get to a point where, yes, women are not marginalised, there are more women, there is no marginalised people, because I don't believe the world can survive prejudice because we're getting a very big population. There are challenges ahead uh, that the scientists are talking about that are mind-boggling, that no generation ever had before. If education and a fair go isn't available to all seven billion people on this planet, we don't have all of the minds that we need to have a chance at solving some of the big problems ahead. Thank you. I'm Daniel, thanks very much for the invitation to join in here today. Um, I mean, I think, uh, listening to your introduction about marginalisation, pretty, I think it is an extremely personal thing and there are so many dimensions to that question of why people feel marginalised, but there is, of course, a direct link between um, culture and art and screen and whether we feel marginalised, if we don't see ourselves reflected back on screen, of course, we feel like we're not included and not and on the margins. So, um, and as we know, you know, 
uh, it's, it's, it's you know, um, proven that, that uh, Australian screens, for example, and television are not reflective of society as it, as it really is. Um, for me, um, uh, setting up an organisation called Cinespace a couple of years ago out in the western suburbs, part of the inspiration for that for me was, was really the change or the accessibility of technology, um, you know, the ability to make great looking stuff on your phones and your cameras now. Uh, uh, most of you would have, many of you might have seen a film called Tangerine, which went to Sundance and was filmed on an iPhone. You know, we're here talking about cinema today. Uh, the shift in technology, of course, has really connected creators directly to audience, you know, YouTube and online, but I think the cinema industry is a little bit further behind that, you know, and, um, and the potential now to create cinema and stories with complexity and, you know, um, is really in the palm of your hand, and so um, for me, that's part of, of the inspiration is that the industry itself is trying to change and is trying to be more inclusive, but it does take time for that <laughs> giant ship to turn around. And so, at the same time, you know, we really need to be seeding storytellers with the tools that they have available to them now um, in a much more grassroots way. So, um, yeah, I think the potential is there for it. so many amazing, creative, wonderful new stories. Um, to be told, and um, I've had the privilege of working with people like Cawthor, who's filming you're going to see a little bit later, and uh, it's in this space, and Matthew here. Um, I think I'm going to stop talking, but, <laughs> um, but just that immediacy of <coughs> filmmaking now is really so exciting and, and amazing. So. Great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm Matthew Victor Pasta. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this. It's amazing. Um, so, for me, as a Filipino Australian, um, the fourth largest migrant group in Australia, um, really, I don't really see that many Filipinos uh, represented in media in any capacity. So for me, um, although years back when I started filmmaking, it was just for passion, just for filmmaking, because I love films. Like, I, Scarface, watched it when I was like 13, I know people will say that's too violent for a 13 year old, whatever. Um, I was really um, influenced by, you know, films growing up, um, art films, Stanley Kubrick films. You know, I just liked films as a, as a kid, and it influenced my worldview because it showed me the horrors of the world and also um, a lot of other, you know, great stories and inspirational things like Gattaca, which we study in high school. And 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 the thing is, like, I hadn't seen any uh, stories from from, you know, the Filipino Australian uh, point of view. So I thought um, I should explore that because for me it was a very important thing at a certain age when I realized that the reason I hadn't explored it was because I was raised in a family that told me to erase my Filipino heritage. I was raised in a family, uh, my father is actually, he, he was a migrant, he um, migrated, uh, he's um, Spanish, Malay, uh, Spanish Malaysian, but he looks very uh, you know, Aussie in that sense, you know, wider than I am. And um, he, he would make fun of like my mom's accent, and I know he did it to fit in. I know that's the kind of person he is. But um, you know, he say Filipino men are ugly, for example. That's why all the Filipino women like me, and all these things. So I grew up in that environment. So for me, it was um, very much. Uh, why didn't I make films about my culture? Maybe because I felt ashamed of it growing up. So I started exploring those issues. So by going deeper into those themes. Um, I was able to explore what it meant to be a Filipino in the West and also explore um, what it, and what it means for me to be that. And I think um, the market for, uh, you know, I guess you could say uh, di the digital world, like there are kids nowadays like, you know, my Chani, my friend Jamie Drew, they get millions of followers. Like Jamie Drew did the tennis prank where he was like, you know, the sex sounds of the tennis, I don't know if anyone saw that, but it was pretty out there and wild. He's, he's of Asian descent, like he, he has a two million person following doing prank videos. Like these, there are kids out there that are already um, representing for, for, for big masses and maybe not in the way that everyone thinks is like the, the right way to represent a culture, for example, right? But for me, it's a love of cinema. I grew up on cinema, I love cinema. So I incorporate the millennial story, the diaspora, of Filipino Australians and how that falls into the cinema aesthetic. So actually my films never play in cinemas here, they play in the Philippines because for some reason they like me over there presenting these issues, but here no one cares about them. So. <laughs> it's funny, thank you. Okay, my name is Zaria, Zara, and I'm the commissioner for the
Victorian Multicultural Commission and the Commission uh, has supported this event. And what we like to do is give support to events, festivals, um, and we just recently at ACME had a presentation of films by students at, um, at RMIT. And they were very moving films. And one of the films that I recall seeing was just short, you know, like a short film, was about a group of actors and how they struggle because they, you know, might have dark skin, they're African, um, they don't get chosen for parts in films because they're not Anglo enough. Uh, and this was very interesting because I thought, well, how, you know, how did they then get ahead and how do we re reflect and, and show diversity? Unless you're watching SBS um, TV, you don't see diversity 